Hello, my name is Todd Barron. I'm a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And we're doing an author interview uh, for gastrointestinal endoscopy. I'm here with Hiroshi Mashimo, who is an assistant professor at the Harvard School of Medicine in Boston, associated with the VA uh, healthcare system. He's going to talk to us about his article, Characterization, Characterization of Buried Glands, Pre- and Post-Radiofrequency Ablation, using three-dimensional optical coherence tomography. So, welcome, Dr. Mashimo. Thanks for having me. And in. you're welcome. And a uh, couple of things before we really get down into your article is, is a lot of people don't understand concepts maybe even in the title. For example, I would hope that most people that read this know what buried glands are, but maybe we should start with what are buried glands. Sure. Well, uh, as you know, with treatment of Barrett's, um, which is quite prevalent now, and a complication of, uh, or thought to be associated with chronic gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, we've shown that with dysplastic uh, uh, areas of dysplasia or tendency going towards cancer, that these can be ablated or taken away, burned, by certain uh, methods, including the radiofrequency ablation, which is what was uh, done in this paper. Sometimes, though, after the radiofrequency ablation, uh, you get the neosquamous, or the normal skin, covering over uh, these glands, uh, Barrett's glands. And so they get somewhat buried. So the subsquamous intestinal metaplasia is what we're calling buried glands in this situation. Hmm. Okay. And, and so number two is uh, you tried to define that uh, using uh, optical coherence tomography. So the, the way you normally, if you, if you will, normally find these buried glands is by biopsy, correct? Correct. Uh, we would, most people would follow a standard Seattle protocol, uh, which is using jumbo forceps uh, every uh, uh, four quadrants uh, and going every one or two centimeters depending on the presence of dysplasia. Right. right. And so the, the idea is that you can miss that with, bi with standard biopsies. Correct. Uh, or that is our thought right. because if you actually do the calculations, the actual biopsies, even if it's a jumbo uh, biopsy, only catches about 1 40th of the surface. Right. More concerning really is the depth. Right. And in these studies, that, including those that we were involved with, it turns out that only about 80 to uh, maybe 40% uh, uh, actually reached the lamina propria. Right. So the real concern is our biopsies even catching right. the very right. right. So it's both sampling and depth of, of sampling. So, and so um, uh, optical coherence tomography, uh, how does that work? Yeah, so it's a relatively new uh, imaging modality, uh, and uh, it was fathered or started, pioneered by Professor James Fujimoto, who is the other senior author in this paper. And basically, like ultrasound, you're bouncing, not sound, but light. And so it's a backscatter analysis. But the interesting thing is then you can get depth result images real time, much like ultrasound. The trade-off, of course, is the light penetration. And in this case, it goes about three millimeters. Mm. So for the gut, that's great, because that's really what you want, is something mm. of that order. Yeah. But the nice thing is you get incredible resolution on the order of, say, five micron resolution. So we're getting near histological pictures real time. And because you don't have a lot of instruments up front, you can put it through even any standard endoscope channel. Right, right. So your findings here were that there were buried glands. Now, you, you looked at it both before treatment and after which to me, because I don't do Barrett's, is uh, a little confusing. You actually get buried glands before the treatment in a Correct. Barrett's patient. Uh, so it turns out that, uh, and we don't know in true distinction from random biopsies, whether they're just at the borders of the mm. neosqu uh, the squamous epithelium uh, or not. Right. But from these studies, uh, it's been shown that you can see buried glands even before treatment. Mm. Uh, and so these are buried Barrett's glands right. uh, underneath the uh, squamous epithelium, and that can be found even in these dysplastic patients of 25%. Mm. Now, it's been shown that once you ablate them on the biopsies, we're seeing these probably about 5%. So it is reduced by radiofrequency ablation. Right. Nevertheless, that were the estimate, th those were the estimates coming from right. the uh, biopsy right. results. Right. So um, how soon before you think this sort of uh, technology will be Let's say it, it, it turns out to be this is very, very helpful. Uh, how would you foresee how long it would take for this to get in the hands of your average gastroenterologist? 
Yes, uh, several companies are certainly launching that. Uh, and I think that uh, now that the footprint of the machine is smaller, uh, these catheters, because it's just a light fiber optic cable, kind of simplistically, is you know can be uh, manufactured as disposable catheters. Mm -hmm. I think that these are quite doable, um, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, one is already coming onto the market. Mm -hmm. um, also, there is ORI available, including light imaging, which are what we're using. Um, uh, the uh, I'm sorry, light lab systems is that. Um, uh, it's been already used for, for example, cardiac catheterizations. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of borrowing from other systems right, too. Right. Uh, but I'm sure there's a learning curve in there, and then there's probably some inter variability in and amongst readers, and maybe even within the same reader. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think the interesting thing of this modality is it's uniquely poised right. that unlike other surfacing image uh, modalities, even if if it's chromogens that we might be using to colorize these areas or try to enhance mm -hmm. them, magnification, uh, narrow band imaging, or even confocal endoscopies, which we do use, but are limited in the depth uh, focus. Right. Uh, this one actually, just like ultrasound, goes right down and looks at it in, right. in a deep way. Moreover, I think OCT, or optical coherence tomography, is unique in the sense that it scans over large areas. Mm. So uh, this paper that is presented really looks over a three-dimensional, uh, not just little focus, little areas right. that we're looking, but a drawback area, in this case two centimeters, but it could conceivably go through the whole esophagus, uh, reconstructing the whole volume. Oh, very interesting. Well, we look forward certainly to, to further developments. What's last question is what what are the, your what is your next step in this in this area? Yes, I think that, uh, and we've gone through this uh, in terms of uh, you know more recent presentations. But uh, the uh, really surprising finding is that when we were looking at biopsies at 20% or 5% post-ablation, we're looking at now on the OCT presence of these berry glands at, say, 70%. And this is not unexpected if you think, once again, that we're only sampling 1 40th on the mm -hmm. biopsies. So it's consistent. Now the main thing is to use the advantage of OCT, which is things that you can't see on the surface, and we started looking at the number of berry glands, mm. or where the glands are, right. or how packed are they, right. and seeing if these can relate to the uh, success of ablation, right. or detecting areas that are not ablated right. well, uh, and in order to maybe shrink those patients in terms of the number of endoscopic uh, sessions sure. that yeah. they need, or probably stratify them mm -hmm. so that uh, we can find those who are at higher yeah. risk. Great. Okay. Well, thank you again. We're looking forward to hearing more things from you. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much.